Not a cloud in the sky. I've been out here messing with my settings, trying to just get it to look nice, but that time of year, everything comes through just washed out. There's no shade, nothing. Bone dry out here. Guys, hey, what's up, garden friends? Jeff here. How's everybody doing? Hope you're doing well. I'm great. Dog just ran through the tripod. Another lovely day out here. It's the last day of September, first day of October when this video comes out, which means time of the September garden tour. Wow, everywhere I go, a harsh shadow. It's fine, just gotta push forward, move through it. Things are gonna be a little bit brief. Just because the August garden tour was a two, <laughs> it was two parts and uh, it was probably more elaborate than it needed to be. I went through like basically every single house plant and garden plant split up into two different videos and got really specific. Not a ton has changed since then though. September was pretty mild months, unusually cold which I, I, that's new to me, a cold September, very odd, which means not a lot's happened with the plants since then. Not a ton's happened in the garden, gotten a few trees in the ground. This is going to be the last garden tour with the palm trees. Those are all going to be going off to storage in 13 days. Oh, and that's the thing, the part I always forget. I'm in zone six, 6A, 6B, right on the line here in St. Louis, Missouri. All of the large palm trees, like see this, that. The really big one right there right there all of those over there these two probably and then this really big alexander palm down there anything that's huge and in a pot more than likely goes off to a storage facility during the winter time i'm lucky enough to live someplace where they'll come and pick them up in the winter and bring them back in the springtime when they get too big for the house so that's usually there's some confusion hopefully that straightens that out from the beginning big palm trees don't stay and neither i don't think i'm gonna take these adenidias inside this winter. I'm going to let them store them, so that'll, those will be gone too. This will be the last look at the pool planters, just because I don't, I don't feel like messing with adenidia palms inside. They're such a pain in the butt. I already know I'm going to be getting frustrated with them. There's only so much space in the garage where I keep the plants. I just don't want to mess with them. I would say the biggest highlight in the garden right now has got to be this corner over here. Isn't it just looking fan- Fantastic. Look at all the blooms on the gingers right now. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. There's about 14 of them, and some of them are still getting ready to open. This is amazing. I wake up in the morning and I'm standing in the kitchen. I can see the beautiful flowers through the window. This was something I had envisioned for the space a few years ago and finally getting to see it come to life. So, all of these gingers right here are the Hidichium flaming torches. Technically hardy zone 7 being up, but I've never had any issues overwintering them here in zone 6. These were all divided off of a larger plant that I skipped right over. I don't usually just jump right into this corner during the garden tour, but we'll get back over there. Each one was planted in 2020, just a single rhizome for each clump. So there were one, two, three, or four clumps planted, but you know, those take time to grow. So 2020, we got like maybe two additional growths out of them. So there were four on each rhizome. Like last year there were some more, but it still wasn't all that impressive. The issue last year was that because there weren't as many growths, they put on their show with all their beautiful flowers, and then it was just over. There weren't enough stems coming up from the ground to have that secession that keeps it going longer. And this year we finally got there. So these had a bloom several weeks ago, and now they have this fantastic show they're putting on right now. And next year it's just going to be even better. Eventually this whole spot there's going to be like a horseshoe shape in here. That's just full of these great big, like 14 inch, 14 to 18 inch big flower spikes. Pollinators love them. They've been all over them. It's a nice pop of color. They aren't a fragrant Hedicium. I like that creamy orange color. So this is perfect. Um, excuse you, Turbo. Hey man, what you- <gasps> No. And that's why I don't let the dogs in the garden. Back on subject here. Gingers have been great. They filled in the spot very nicely. It looks great through that window. I love the backdrop with the red banana cannas back there that have gotten absolutely out of control, massive. I did do some things over here since the last garden tour. I got this fantastic, beautiful little gem magnolia planted up over here. It's a zone seven, but in my area, lots of people are growing the little gems and they've been doing well every like decade or so. We'll have a really bad freeze. It'll sometimes kill them way back, but it doesn't appear to have ever killed any of them completely away. So that just I'm being hopeful here. <laughs> Little Gem's one of my favorites. It was the most appropriately sized for the spot. They flower freely throughout the summer. Great big white flowers that smell nice. 
And uh, there was another reason, I don't remember what it was there. That's when I chose to go there. When I planted that, I had to pull a ton of these bikini teeny color caseas out. Tons of them, but I have them everywhere. They grow basically like weeds. I wasn't torn up about pulling those out. And while I was doing that, I also ripped out some of the banana cannas, or actually I cut them way back because some of them had started to lean from some storms we had had. And it was just too much. I love the cannas back here. I like the color contrast and I really like the way the dark foliage that's on the outer edge of those leaves plays with the darker foliage with the brown undersides of the magnolia. You have the darker stems and the bikini teenies. I just, I think that there's a nice color pairing here, but they are a bit much. Like, I don't think I'll ever let this clump get any bigger than this. It can keep growing that way, like along the backside of this wall here, but it just can't come forward any further because it had ended up shading things in this spot. So it was necessary to get those out of there. I'm glad that those are gone. Just too much excess. The Pharaoh's mask. Well, you just saw the dog run through it, but it, it'll be okay. There's a fairly tough Colocasia. Planted that there as an experiment, not hardy in zone six, at least they're not typically listed as hardy in zone six, but this is a very warm spot, hence the, like the little palm trees and the gingers aren't supposed to be over here. And the cannas that are coming back on their own every year. It's also why I thought this would be an okay spot for a zone seven magnolia, because there's a lot of zone seven stuff going on over here in this corner. It's the spot where the snow melts first during the winter time. It just stays warm over here. So I thought, let's give it a try. Put one in there. Hasn't done a ton of growing. It's been okay. I just think that the shading that it ended up getting from the banana cannas was maybe too much because as soon as I got those out of there, within uh, like three days, they started to straighten back up and I'm seeing signs of more growth out from the bottoms of them just from that very slight change in light, which means that they probably weren't getting quite enough sun. So I have to remember that next year, that if we have any storms that pull those banana cannas forward and start to shade things, that I gotta cut them out or pin them up. Can't just leave them like that. That won't work out well for anything growing underneath them. I wasn't sure, because with the Pharaoh's mask, that's one that's like they can take a lot of sun. Not necessarily full sun, but I figured that they would be okay with more dappled light, but it is okay. It was just a, like a couple of leaves when I put it in the ground. So it's done some growing. Next year, if it survives the winter, I am hopeful that it'll look more like the ones you'll see in a few minutes underneath the Alexander Bob. Those are looking nice. Bananas are just banana-ing. This clump hasn't done much this year. One, because the irrigation's off over here and you can only do so much with drip. At least I can't do a ton with drip because I don't have the water pressure to do a lot. This clump has done much better, always does. It's just a better spot for them, I suppose. That's actually a change. I said it always does. That's not necessarily true. The first couple years I had these bananas planted up, this clump never got bigger than five or six feet tall. And then this one over here was always much, much, much larger than the others. But that has shifted some. I think that's partially a maturity thing. These have started to fruit and flower almost every single year. They're putting up something. And when that happens, then you lose mother plants. So there's been a good amount of die off on the inside because of that. These haven't done that yet which is opposite. It should be the bigger ones are, huh, I don't know, light exposure and again, the irrigation, the drip just doesn't run as strongly over here. I'm totally okay with the size on them. This is gonna sound weird, probably going to be surprising to some people, but I've been looking at this spot all summer, like between this banana tree, this clump right here and this clump, and I'm debating maybe doing away with this banana clump next year. Turbo just came running up to me, sopping wet. It's like 55 degrees. Well, the pool's like 90 degrees, so I guess it's okay. He can take advantage of the heated water right now. The clump on this end, because it has flowered and fruited multiple times, it has these basically bare spots in them. When a banana tree flowers and fruits, it dies. Just that one pseudo stem dies off but that creates little holes inside of the clumps. And there are ways around that. You prune them at the right time of year, then you'll encourage more pups to come out and then that won't happen. But I didn't do that because they took a long time to get going this year. I didn't want to give them any pruning that I didn't know would be beneficial when they started off so small. What doesn't necessarily show in camera is that this clump right here, or it's now multiple clumps, from one end to the other, it's like, this is close to being about 15 feet. I could do a lot with the space without these bananas here. I will probably always have the one chunk right here, but this portion of it right here, I, I wouldn't mind if that weren't there anymore, as well as the bamboo in the front. That's going to get moved, not 
I'm not going to get rid of it. I'm just going to move it. It's not supposed to be in the front of the garden. That's a whole long story. You can talk about that when it's time to move the clump. That's just like what survived from a clump that died many years ago. Been letting it mature before I move it. But don't you just think that if that weren't right there, that this would have a better balance to it and I could have some other type of maybe evergreen shrubbery in this spot or just do something else cool right there, but I don't know. Perhaps also it's possible that even just having this bamboo clump in the front, that alone actually could just be what's throwing me off. So in the spring, I'm gonna be moving that clump and then I'm just gonna think about the banana situation. Like I said, I'll leave the ones on the end, but the bajus right here, they get so big. I would almost prefer to pull them out and put the dwarf Orinacos back in here because they stay small and I like their leaf structure. They have a more of a tight spacing between their leaves, like, almost like a leaf umbrella on top of them. I don't know, that's the best thing I can think of to describe it. But those usually look nice planted like at the ends where you have these rounded spots because they maintain more of a rounded shape to their clump. Whereas the bajus, they kind of just do their thing, which is fine. That's one of the reasons I like them and they're just so reliable. That's why it's a fantastic hardy banana. Just, you don't really have to worry about them. I don't technically even have to protect these during the winter time, which is very, very nice. But I do just because I want to preserve as much pseudo stem. That's the trunk. It's not really a trunk. The more you can keep alive during the winter time, then the better growth you're going to have the next year because they get like a two foot head start if you can preserve two feet. You get it. It's going to save the rest of that conversation for a different time of year when we talk more about planning things out. But that's what's going on over here. Everything's looking good. Loving the sables. Little sable miners and their fan leaves. Looking pretty. Bikini teenies. Loving life as always. Got the blue dune grass down there. Looking nice. See the banana. They need a prune too. I don't think I'm going to bother. We're only a few weeks away from frost. Speaking of bananas, look at the insets. These things, I need to back up. You can't even see those in the frame. I'm standing pretty far away. Look at them. Look at those. Freaking monsters. I just threw two that were pretty cheap in the ground. They were probably a couple feet tall back in the springtime. And this is probably the most growth I've gotten out of an end set in a single year. They will grow. I mean, it's a banana. They'll put on a good amount of growth in a single year but usually I have them in containers and it is just amazing the difference in growth that you get when you have something in the ground versus in the container. I've noticed that with cannas, bananas, just the majority of plants. You get them in the ground, they have more access to water, their roots can spread out more, there's just a lot more nutrient and it's massive growth. These are easily, we'll have to remember they're sloped up about maybe a foot. I would say they're, they're pushing 10 feet probably would be my guess maybe even 12. a little hard to account for when i know that they're planted on a slope but they are monsters and they're looking great i haven't decided if i'm going to be bringing those inside during the winter time we'll see normally it's something that i can find here for relatively cheap during the spring and you know every single square foot in the grow space is valuable I don't have the conditions to overwinter these as dormant plants anymore. The grow space is too warm with the new heater. I mean, it's perfectly warm for the plants I want to keep growing throughout the winter time. It's too warm for storing canna rhizomes, bulbs, and caladium bulbs, and then cutting these back as dormant plants. I just don't see it going very well. And I, even my basement, I don't think, would be quite cool enough. But they are so easy to overwinter. You just cut all the leaves off. You dig them up. You cut all the roots off. You let the water drain up out of them. Like, you turn the what's left of that trunk upside down. Do that for a few days and you just stick them someplace cool, dark, and dry. I don't think I have any place that's cool, dark, and dry though, but it's something I'm going to think about. I love these here so much that as much as I love this Alexander palm, it's one of my favorite palm trees that I have. If it weren't here, I still think that this corner would absolutely shine and be stunning. Even without this palm here, I'm not trying to foreshadow anything. Although this thing is getting pretty big. I don't know how much longer that's going to fit in the greenhouse, but hopefully for a few more years. Everything that's been underplanted in here has done really, really well. The Pharaoh's mask, Colocaceas, and look at them. They're just neat. Weird. Weird plants, but like weirdly awesome. Curved leaves, the really thick veins. Been more prolific than I had expected because I wasn't able to water this palm tree as planned this year. So this is the first time I've ever kept this palm over here. Typically, okay, need to back up. Regular viewers are probably sick of hearing me talk about this, but for anybody who's new here, this spot used to have a very large saucer magnolia of some type. I don't know if it's a Jane or Sulardia, whatever it was, had magnolia scale. Had to cut it out, leave the space empty for a few years. 
And uh, during those few years, I had the Alexander Palm over here. It was a little hole dug out so it would be stable and not blow around. I loved the view during the summer. It was so nice, especially in 2020 and 2021 because I wasn't able to be outside as often. So the view through the windows was, it's always important to me, but during those two years specifically, it mattered a lot to me. This past spring, I had mentioned that when I decided to put this over here that I might miss it being in this window, but I wasn't sure because it had gotten so big, all you see are three trunks through the windows. And then all of these things I was hoping were gonna grow enough that it wouldn't even matter and it all worked out. Everything went as planned. These got really full. I wouldn't have even been able to have seen the palm tree if it were there. Okay, so that leads back to how the palm tree is right now. I have never grown it in this spot before. The hole there is probably, I don't know, foot and a half deep is how far that is down there in the ground. One thing I hadn't accounted for, I had wondered about, but I wasn't sure was how this is going to do in this spot because all of the water from this surrounding area drains right into this hole. Because path of least resistance, there's a hole there with gravel in it, That's it becomes a well. Alexander palms are they're pretty sturdy. They like a good amount of water. So I wasn't really worried about the plant like, drowning, anything like that. I spent a long time getting the drip set up in this container so this palm tree would have its basically its own zone of watering. It was really for this entire area. And uh, almost every day the drip would run and there'd be water sitting on the surface of the pot, meaning that it was filling up completely, not draining away. That's too much for every single day. If every now and then the ground is so saturated that water can't drain through, I'm not worried about that with this palm tree and with those pharaoh's masks. Not a big deal. It's not great for the sedum, but whatever. It's an annual. That's not, that's not something I'm concerned about. The palm tree did okay with it. There was a point where I noticed that it was looking like the leaves were getting limp, and that's a indicator that it's way too much water. So after playing around with the drip, the amount of time it was running, eventually I just shut it all off. So this hasn't been getting watered by me in like a month and a half. Any water it gets is from whatever's draining underneath the pot and being sucked back up by the palm tree. And then I have a sprinkler head that's back there that just a little bit of it goes over the top and that's been enough to keep those colocasies going and that the soil's moist from down below. That helps a lot but it didn't give me a lot of growth out of the lemon coral sedum or the heliconias. The heliconias have done some growing, but this just this wasn't the year for heliconias out here. The heliconia, if you want to know what I was talking about and you weren't aware, this is the Petra heliconia. Very similar to the Andromeda, started these in the grow space last winter. I think the main difference is that the Petra's supposed to be a little bit more stout, a tiny bit more green on the outside of the bract there and a slightly larger foliage. That's the only difference that I can decipher when I look at it. It seems to be less vigorous, but the spot did not get anywhere near as much sun as I thought it would. I didn't think the Alexander palm would shade things quite so drastically, but it really did. They're more open, right? So I just thought more light would come through. And I had somewhat been hopeful and reliant on the angle of the sun doing something, but the trees out here, everything, like this oak, things gotten huge. The maples, things have just gotten so big that when the sun's lower in the sky, it's not making a huge difference because it's being blocked by the trees. Beautiful trees. Trees that I don't think I ever give enough attention to on this channel, like this oak. I mean, that thing's a freaking monster. I wouldn't be sad if it weren't here, but I have a great amount of appreciation for it. You know, an oak, they live a long time, sturdy trees. Not a fan of the fact that it drops leaves basically all winter long and it's super messy. However, it is huge and it's a beautiful tree. But yeah, so that's part of why I think there wasn't a ton of growth out of what was going on there this year because of weather. We had really weird weather this summer. It was either too cold or too hot for things. Not a ton of humidity during the month of July, which is usually the month that really gets the tropicals going. We didn't have that this year. It was just hot and dry, like too hot. The kind of hot where the plants are just like, ugh, they don't want to do anything. So it didn't really have much Heliconia weather, but they did some growing. Have another flower coming up on that one. I'm happy about that at least. The Stuttgart cannas, I love them, but they are being very shaded out by the Enset bananas here. So I've, it doesn't matter. Those aren't going to go in the spot next year anyways. Those will be dug up and I'm, even though I don't really have a place to put them, I'm going to figure something out. Maybe I'll store those in somebody else's garage. Ask around my friend, like, does anybody mind if I throw a paper bag full of some rhizomes in your garage? Just, they need some place to go where they won't freeze, but they won't be warm. Do you mind? That may end up happening. The bird of paradise. 
I haven't updated on this plant ever because I put it in a stupid spot, like real dumb. It was a great idea at the time because I was just trying to get more privacy. I was trying to block out the street and this thing is, it's a monster. For a bird of paradise, I suppose it's still small, but it's done a lot of growing. But I don't think I've shown it in any of the garden tours since I repotted it and it was delivered because you can't, you can't even see the dang thing because of all the other stuff that's in front of it. And I, I how am I going to get this out of here? It's like it's all the way back there. I suppose when the people come to pick up the palm tree, they use a crane to get this one out of the ground. Nothing unusual about that. Don't judge me. People do weird things for the things that they're passionate about. But I suppose if they use the crane to get the Alexander palm out of here first, and that will probably open up a path to slide that out. They have a crane. They can go ahead and use it to pull that out of there too. I think it's somewhat unnecessary, but that would be an option. Most of the annuals are looking pretty much the same as they were back in August. The sun impatience are more full than they were, but less flowers because it's fall now. There's less sun in the sky. It's hanging down lower. Days are getting shorter. So that definitely impedes on their flowering. These are the spreading salmon which when I planted them, I wasn't all that into them. I had actually gotten them by mistake. As it turns out, I actually really like them. Out of all of the variegated sun impatience I planted this year, these have been the most vigorous. That's partially because they're in the ground, but I have some others that are in the ground that were nothing like this as far as their vigor goes. And the color on them intensified. When it was a more pale pink on the flower, I just, I didn't like it because having the pale, pinkish salmon, it's salmon. Having the salmon color with that yellow variegation to me just made things look dry and washed out. Turbo, you're standing directly in front of all the flowers. There we go. But the colors did start to intensify and I liked it more as time went on. They started to look nicer. Might do that again next year. Not sure. I don't really need to think about that. Generally the October garden tour is when I'll go through and have like final thoughts and what worked, what didn't, what I would change. Uh, those sorts of things. I kind of started to do that, and not kind of. I talked about that banana clump for a while, but there'll probably be a repeat of that coming up here in about a month or so. Yeah, as I was saying, not a ton has happened with the annuals. They're all stretched out. They, this would be when I would cut them back, but there's no point. They'll be dead to the ground in about two or three weeks here. It came out nice. Everything looked good. They did their thing, but again, just not much to say with them. Yeah, the same thing with the gingers that I have back here growing behind everything they're looking good but just not a lot to say those haven't done a lot in the last month because it really just hasn't been that warm and there's not as much light out i did really enjoy how this came out look how big this caladium is it's gonna be like two feet tall pull planters on this end looking good but still nothing's changed with them very full the flowers are starting to brown out on them not as much color that's what happens this time of year. They start to dry up. They do have like a nice pinkish tint to them, but a lot of the intensity has gone away. I did finally start to get some growth out of the orange sun impatience over here. Not that it matters because they'll be dead in a couple weeks. Those just took forever to get going this year. The tropical rose were fine, but I started those as much larger plants. The orange ones, they really lagged behind. I think next year, if I were to repeat this, then I would try and find the variegated orange ones in a much larger size because I was thinking, it was like, oh, they're impatient. They'll catch up with each other. They never did. I guess they're kind of catching up with them, each other right now, but not so much. I also noticed that any spot where I had the orange sun impatience, I'll be able to show you better on the other side, but where I had the sweet potato vines planted underneath them, they did not do anywhere near as well in those spots either. Partially probably because sweet potato vines are sucking up a lot of the energy and because it's, it was just too much vigor. But you'll see when I get back to the other end of the pool. It's not, there's a clump where it's just like sweet potato vines growing all over the inside of the impatience. Again, more annuals. I like how the berm came out this year. Lots of color, but again, nothing's changed. Very colorful. We'll definitely be doing this again next year, but I will go heavier with the impatience and take them down further. I left a big clump of the butterbur here, the Pedicich japonicus, because I just, I liked the giant leaves, but it made this look kind of weird and wonky. So that will have to come out next year and get the impatience all the way across and uh, get to enjoy the butterbirds in the spring, pull them out for the summer and let those annuals grow through. I actually like how that's worked out. I haven't planted this up yet. Mm, never mind. we don't need to talk about that. House plants give lots of updates on these in the last garden tours. That would be the place to watch if you want to know like the names of everything and how they've been doing. It'd be that video. These will all be coming inside here in just a matter of weeks. The Ciba Blute, the Pothos, just keeps, well, I don't, I, I staked it down. I don't know if there's some kind of animal running through here at night or what's happening, but 
it seems like every other day I come out here and I stake it up and it's knocked back down by something. It's not particularly windy over here, like at all. It's pretty protected in this spot, actually. So I'm not sure what that's about. The ginger planters are looking nice. These two gingers right here, they had a rough time. We've had a couple cool nights here and I thought they'd be okay, but nah, <laughs> apparently I was wrong. They're not dead, there's no mush in them. I think for the most part, they're actually, I think they dehydrate. It's not warm enough, so they're not taking up water. So I'm going to move those to a warmer corner and in the next couple of days, it's supposed to warm back up here. Not terribly warm, but much warmer than it's been. Get those rehydrated, probably get my cut back. And then it's really about time to get those. I'm talking about these right here. The two plants look like garbage on each side. This ginger right there. Yeah, it's, it's about time to get them ready for their winter dormancy. Anyways, I'm not sure how I'm gonna pull that off or what I'm gonna do with them, but I'm gonna figure it out. The ginger planters, doing well. Gingers have been growing. Got the creeping Jenny inside the Miami planters. Loving the Cordelin, Fredocasas in here. They came out lovely. I'm really happy with the colors and the vibrance and the various structures with the different plants that are in those. I think they just look lovely. There's a look at the garden with the leaf barrel hanging out over there. I've got to find a different place to keep that thing. It's an eyesore that doesn't need to be there. Get one with wheels so I can keep in the driveway and bring it around. That would probably make a lot more sense than just having a barrel right there. This is a nice look at the pool planters look at all of that color. Probably my favorite thing I did out here this year. I love the color palette with the Supertunia Vista Jazzberries, those Supertunia Honeys, which didn't get to do much because they're not as vigorous as the Jazzberries, but they still added a pop of yellow and orange. The Sweetheart, Caroline, whatever, Ipomia, the smaller of the wine series, whatever. Sweet Potato Vines, those. Lovely, you can see right here what I was talking about, how they're growing not fantastically, that's not the word. There's been a good amount of struggle between the sun and patience and the sweet potato vines, but the ones that are planted in between the sweet potato vines, like the petunias, and then on the other side, that orange one's doing better. I just, I don't think they paired well. So that's something to remember for next year also, is that to keep the uh, supertunia Vista Jazzberries with the orange, which I would actually prefer the orange with the purple anyways, over the green. I probably won't remember any of this next year, but maybe maybe someone will remind me. I don't know. That'd be nice. The Matophyllum throwing out a new leaf. That's always nice, always exciting. Get some new growth out of something that's just been repotted. Down here, what's changed? Oh, there has been some changes over here, which will be talked about in next week's vlog next Saturday. You'll get like to see more of what happened right here. But basically, this was planted up with a bunch of the Magellan Mix zinnias, and they all just got covered in powdery mildew, and instead of attempting to treat it or anything like that, I was just like, Man, get them out of here too many other plants around that i don't feel like having to treat for things when diseases and pests and things show up unless it's a plant i really really love i just give it the boot they were great while they lasted but i figured just throwing a couple of these nice single flowered chrysanthemums looks nice too and with this palm tree being going off to a greenhouse in less than two weeks just wasn't something i was willing to fuss over so those are gone those are just set in there they're still in their containers just hanging out right there. I can lift them, pull them right out. Same thing with everything that's in this that will all be coming out when this goes off to the greenhouse. I think that's the only thing over here. Y'all have seen everything else. Bromeliads blooming, doing its thing. The tie, I don't think it's opened up any new leaves since last time, or it had just opened up a new leaf during the last garden tour. So there is a nice, great, big, chunky leaf back there that's looking beautiful. Metanella, it is amazing the growth that this thing puts out when things just get a little bit cooler. Look at there's so much new stuff coming out of this thing. And also, this plant hasn't stopped flowering in over a year. I don't, I don't know if y'all are growing these, but you need to. Medanillas, get them. That would be a plant worthy of its own spotlight. I'm going to talk about that one some more in the future because it's really, really just been a fantastic house plant. Even though it's got like some crispiness on it from where the heater was blown on it during the winter time, and then some more from when I put it in too much sun when I brought it outside for the spring and summer. It's just kept going, like nothing has stopped it. It's kept budding, it's kept flowering. There have been times when it's not flowering as much, but it's never stopped. I really, I appreciate that. I like a plant that's low maintenance and keeps flowering. There aren't very many of those. So I very much appreciate that one. I'm gonna have to do a lot of cleaning out in this container before they pick this one up to take to storage, aren't I? Spring fling, spring fling, spring fling caladium over here. Still looking beautiful, much more prolific this year than it was the year before. 
that'll just get cut back. That stores with the whole entire plant during the winter time. I'll do the same thing with this curcuma over here, this ginger, which is, I don't, I didn't even have the camera on it. There you go. Now you know what I'm talking about. Oh, so pretty. I've loved having that ginger in there. I'm fairly confident that if I cut that back to the base, like all the way down to the soil level, that should return next year. I would think, I mean, if the colladiums are coming back, then this probably will also. If not, then it would mean that the Adonidia is not getting enough water during the winter time. This is not even planted in here. You can't, again, oh my goodness, the problem is when the sun's at this angle, I can't see my, my viewfinder. This isn't even planted in here, so that's just something I can lift right out. There are some Heliconia starts down in this pot that just haven't done a ton. I'll pull them out though and overwinter those in the grow space in a nice, warm, very brightly lit spot. I'm going to be doing some stuff this winter to try and get a lot more growth out of the Heliconias before I bring them outside, thinking that will set them up for much better flowering for next summer. And down here, the hot tub wall, it's, it's like, okay, well, not much has changed here. It just makes me happy. I love this spot, especially the Eureka Palm. It's done so much growing and it's gotten like the nice golden hues on the inside with the white cast along the trunks and the ring. It's just ugh, such a beautiful palm tree. I love that palm tree. But again, not much has changed down here since the last garden tour. Crotons are still looking good. Gingers are still doing their thing. Supertunia Vista bubblegum that's down here. I mean, it's grow like a beast. <laughs> that's, that's what they do. They grow like a beast. One little plant. You get all of this. There are tons of buds on the hibiscus over here. So those will be looking pretty nice over the next few weeks. I'm imagining they're probably going to be small flowers. Like every single one that opens up is probably going to be smaller and smaller and smaller. Cooler temperatures, smaller flowers. But that's okay. It still looks nice. Got some nice growth over here out of the electric blue gecko. Yes, that's who you are. Yes. Can I remember if it's the sapphire or the electric blue? It's the electric blue. It's the improved variety that's larger, more robust, and more vigorous. And I would say that is definitely true. It does crisp up an awful lot. And this space is fairly sheltered. It gets light until about, I don't know, noon, one. And then it gets dappled light throughout the rest of the day. And it's still got some scorch on it. Some of that storm damage too from the leaves being blown around. Don't know if you'll be able to see it on camera, but there's a very very light metallic -y blue sheen to the inside of those leaves. Probably be a little bit easier to see on this one if you're, no, and it depends on the time of day too. Middle of the day, it's more of a reddish purple, like Merlot sort of shine, sheen to it. And you get that blue I've noticed more in the later afternoon and you have to be standing in the right spot. The Calling it blue, I really do think is a stretch. The black coral, which I would imagine is probably what the electric blue gecko has been cultivated off of. This one, I notice more of a blue sheen with this one in the evening than I do with the electric blue gecko. But that's also probably largely just a location thing, like the way it's setting the angles you view the plant at. The only plant that I like really gung-ho on making sure it has a repot before moving everything inside is this hibiscus here. It got a repot earlier in the year. And I think I said when I did it that it would probably need another one later in the summer. And well, here we are, early fall. It definitely needs it. it the growth on it has slowed way, way, way down. And uh, it's still looking nice. It's been cool. So I haven't expected a ton of growth out of it. This is a plant, the variegated sea hibiscus, that can put on a ton of growth during the growing season. And it really didn't do that. And I'm going to go ahead and just assume that that's because it was in a container that was way too small. It's been a fuss-free plant. It's been an amazing plant. I absolutely love this hibiscus. I will take this over any ficus any day. It is an amazing house plant. Highly suggest you give it a try as long as you have really bright light. They can grow like an absolute beast though. It has had regular pruning. Maybe that has something to do with it. I don't know. I just think that it could use a larger pot before I take it inside. I don't want to have to struggle with this during the winter, keeping it hydrated. I think it'd be smart to get on top of that now instead of later, right? I think so. A little thermometer started flashing on the screen. Apparently the sun is too much for the camera today. Even though it's only 60 something degrees outside. Over here, there's not a ton to talk about. I think it's looking nice. I really, really, oh, this angle's not bad. I don't mind standing over here. This works just fine. The lime zinger. Xanthosomas that are under planted underneath that Adenidia palm have done a good amount of growing considering they weren't planted that long ago. I dropped a couple of those pink chrysanthemums just down around the base of that palm because that's, you know, the whole thing's being lifted out of the ground and whatever I would plant in front of it would be destroyed. So I just set them down in their pots in this spot for right now. Is that a better look? 
Much better view. I love the Weimzinger Xanthosomas. Adenidia itself has finally started doing some growing since it got repotted. The crown on this has constantly been covered in scratch marks. Whenever it loses a leaf base, one of these right here, whenever it loses one of those bases, I get so excited because you have that nice fresh green. And then they've been covered in these lines. And it took me forever to figure out what was going on there. And I finally saw it. Squirrels running up and down the trunk to get to the bird feeders. That's why that's been caught up. I know none of you were wondering. I at least felt nice about figuring out what it was that was happening there. So next year can try and plan something out differently for that. The Obuletan, I almost got rid of this thing. I talked about that in the last garden tour, how it just wasn't doing anything for me because I personally think that this variety, which I think is called like Tiger's Eye, something like that, has a pretty wild look to it, almost a weedy look to it. I guess it heard me talking trash about it and it went ahead and it's been blooming pretty much non-stop ever since. As long as it's blooming, I don't mind it. Without blooms on it, though, look, I mean, look at that. That doesn't look nice. I don't enjoy seeing that through the window, but when there are flowers through the window and there's hummingbirds on them, that's cool. I'm good with that. Where space is valuable. They got to earn that. Oh, and here's the mother clump of the gingers I started talking about in the beginning of the video, the Hidichium flaming torches. Still some flowers coming out of this one, which is nice because last year it was the same issue as with the other ones where the clump had been made smaller from dividing it up and then didn't get like the secession. It was just a couple weeks of flowers and that was it. But now I'm getting that back, which makes me very happy. Everything down here in the front, it really, it hasn't done anything. Then cold and chilly. The Nanooks, the, considering those were just thrown in there as some cuttings, looking pretty good. The variegated sun impatience, nah, not so much. I don't think there's enough sun over here in this spot for sun impatience anymore. And you can see a nice big one down here where there's more light, but in there, I just don't see that in the future of this garden bed. The way the trees behind me have grown so much, they're just not getting the light that they need. So maybe I'll do regular impatience next year or start them just bigger, get like put full size ones in there, which would cost a lot more money, but it would look pretty awesome. I don't know, can think about that next year. That was just a long explanation as to why nothing's really changed over here in this spot, but I love it. I think it's very pretty. I do kind of miss having the croton over here, but I still think it looks nice. I love that Adenidia palm, so I would say it's worth the change. The croton has been doing great. So even though it's not in its usual spot, still getting plenty of growth out of it. Seemingly happy, same thing with the pygmy date palm. This is the most successful year I have ever had with a new guinea impatient. This thing is absolutely massive. It goes almost all the way to the ground and then all the way back there in that pot. There's probably close to, there's at least four feet. It's not even probably close to between this end of the growth and then what's down here on the ground. This was just thrown in here as a, as a like hanging basket. It's probably 12 by 12, something like that. It was a good size when I put it in here. But my thing with the new guineas has always been I'm either not giving them enough light or it's too much light or we'll have like a really crazy hot and humid smell come through and rot them. But the weather was much more dry this year. And that's like the one big thing I'll take from that was at least got some nice growth out of the new guinea impatience. Last look at the pool pots. And then I think we are up to date on everything out here. They're looking pretty. If this were August, I'd be starting to come in here and give these sun impatience a cut back they're starting to get kind of raggedy but I'm not going to do that since this is all going to be torn up here in about a week or so and that was I don't know may as well enjoy the color that's there even if there are some spots on the leaves no big deal I don't mind especially from far away all you see is the color that's all I care about just so much color lots and lots of color over here oh and if anybody was wondering these are just viburnums that are waiting to go in the ground I'm going to be getting a few more and kind of hedging off some areas in the garden. I think I'm going to do a separate video also like just a tour of the palm trees before they get taken away. It would just make this one too long to really go into detail with all of them in this video and I've been growing a lot of these for several years if not longer than that and it'd be just nice for them to have their own dedicated video. So if you wanted more about the palm trees and get to that at another time, probably sooner than later, since a lot more are going to be gone in a couple of weeks. Oh, that was one thing I forgot to, I guess this will be in the palm tree video, but I've talked about in all the garden tours, so there's the update. <laughs> Tiny little inflorescence here on the Adenidia palm. There's another one coming out. It's, it's, it's not going to be seeing anything spectacular from that. But it's always fun when the palm trees start to flower and grow. I don't know why I'm still talking. I don't know if you can tell. I don't really have much of a voice <laughs> this week, so we'll wrap it up. Hope everybody's doing well, having a great day and a great life, and everything's just going absolutely beautifully for you. Comment down below, say hi, what's going on in your gardens? Hopefully fun things. All right, as always, and most importantly, everybody, keep on growing. Bye-bye.